canister, and I think it will shock you when you see some of the photographs in terms of the quantities of butane canisters that we, we were faced with within this flat. So it was a, a lot of cigarette stubs as well, carelessly discarded around the flat. <coughs> there was um, combustible materials around the flat and also um, on the cupboard as well. There was 400 removed just a couple yeah. of weeks before this photograph was taken. Four weeks prior, the support workers had removed 400 canisters from the address, and within a four week period, we counted approximately 350 butane canisters, with which this one was inhaling on a, on a, on a regular so basis. Just from an operational <coughs> context, you've seen the explosion of one butane plant instead, times that by 300, expansion ratio of 250 to 1. <coughs> really, really significant hazard and other partners wouldn't understand that because they see the butane risk as a risk of drug chaotic lifestyle. So we have obviously escalated the hazard and the intervention because of our knowledge and understanding of risk. That's why we need to be in the mash. Sorry, Can I ask you something? Yeah, of course. You know, the same, is it younger people doing it more or, or is it like... Very difficult to identify the, the, <coughs> because I don't think the prevalence has been set. So it's something that we're just really scratching the surface on. Legal highs are something that have become more and more sort of prevalent within our communities and it's something that we're looking to tackle within the multi-agency ASB group and some of the work that we do. Um, what is important is that we have powers to utilise that can prevent some of this and, and Michael tell you about the prohibition notice we put on. When this was brought back to my attention, uh, we immediately informed the fire protection team based at Bellevale Fire Station uh, and as well as uh, requesting that the support workers actually remove the canisters, our fire protection team served a prohibition notice on the housing association who own the blocks of flats and support workers agency and that was to actually pre prevent the storage of butane canis canisters on the premises and ultimately put the owners back on them to, to ensure this lady wasn't bringing the butane canisters onto the premises. Therefore, within 24 hours, that risk was removed, which is, was a really good result for us. Also, the, the lady was put into definitive care. Um, so, so we had a really good outcome, but obviously it's an ongoing issue. Sure. <coughs> um, just go on to the other presentation, please, Sean. Sure. And uh, then the only the, the only next bit was your questions and comments. Apologies if I've run over. And there are um, copies of the Liverpool Community Safety Plan for 2015-16 at the back if you would like it. So. Thanks, man. Thanks, everyone. Brock. Any questions or comments? Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the butane. <laughs> um, presumably, with that quantity, it would have blown up the whole of the flats, not just be dangerous to that one, but to one of the neighbours as well. Absolutely. That's why I did, um, obviously, the referral and the removal of the carriages has <laughs> reduced the risk not only to the occupier, but the other residents within the flat, and ultimately the, the fire crews who would have potentially be faced with the fire situation within that flat. So the risks are absolutely uh, huge. I think also just to stop it at source, our protection officers found out <coughs> which outlet she was buying them from. Oh, yeah, and paid them a visit. Okay. Paid them a visit. Okay. Not every agency can, can have that sort of involvement. Could you just ask the following? So I, I'm totally unaware of that. So, I mean, I've heard of people highs and I know other things, but I was totally unaware of that. And I would just ask whether we need some kind of um, public awareness campaign. I think ju just in relation to that, um, that presentation was delivered to the Safeguard and Adults Board subgroup. Um, Natalie Karashini, who has all your signatures, um, Natalie has taken that and, and provided that presentation to all her staff. So that's already being discharged through the Safeguard and Adults Board. <coughs> And, and obviously that's why we put so much resource into that partnership area. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I know in Scotland if you want to buy a bottle of Kayleen and Morby from the chemist you have to sign it. Because, um, well, they'll do it like getting the morphine out with a straw. And, you know, if you go into town and someone's drunk, 
you won't see it them in town in, in, in the major supermarkets. And I'm just wondering if they're not making fun of the place that, you know, you'd have to sign. I know it's, or that you find you retain. I think the availability of butane is so vast we did some research and it's available well, on the likes of Amazon, mm -hmm. eBay, pound yeah. shops and yeah, well, but yeah. I do agree. With this technology it could flag up who's mm -hmm. buying it. And you know, local people, small funds in the local shop, you know, reverse for work a drink, you won't save them and so just look it look the likes of them people they're not they're gonna go to a local shop to get that. Yeah. But they're not they're not capable to go further the fields. They probably haven't got a car or anything. So the local businesses must know what the sound of you saying to. So I think, you know, they've got the cigarettes behind the white cap itself. So I think they need to do something like on the line, you know, like that. Just a suggestion. Right. Yeah, thank you. This, it, this is a case for lobbying, isn't it? You know, this is exactly the sort of thing to lobby on with the LGA, that type of thing. Bulk sale of flammable things like this. But actually, as I go around, you know, particularly when we were doing a bit of campaigning the last few weeks, you'd be, well, I'd say you'd be amazed, maybe you wouldn't be, but the number of these sparklets bulbs yeah. that you oh, yeah. see yeah. discarded, yeah. now, you know, maybe that's got nitric oxide in it, um, or that type of thing, but do you know if there's anybody decanting something like butane, propane, God knows what, into these small little balls. The nitric oxide. The, the nitric oxide, is, I don't think that's flammable though, is it really? Well, it, it's, it's still a, a significant risk to us. Mm. Joe Cunliffe, who's one of our IIT officers, we've actually amended the presentation. The full presentation had nitric oxide contained within it, which, like I say, went to the Safeguard and Adults Board subgroup. Mm. So that will be pushed up into the Safeguard and Adults Board. And then the, that's what I'm saying about managerial resource in so it's not always always the left hold and the baby the risk is shared across all the partners to contribute to this so that will come through the safeguard and adults board and again it's one of the areas where uh, the deputy sits on in terms of the safety the, the health and well-being board and what we want to do is try to work together as a multi-agency partnership to because it holds more weight and more power but we bring the attention to partners and then they help us to, uh, to tackle the issues. Is that okay? We, we'll then. bring this up at the LGA. We'll, we'll, we'll have this brought up. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to ask Mike, um, this is obviously a local case, is this something that's going to be across the We believe so, it's a growing issue. Yeah. I haven't heard of this. I'm really shocked mm -hmm. that I haven't heard of this. I think it, it, it is a fair, it's fairly new, but it is a growing <coughs> trend. I heard of glue years ago was a big problem, wasn't it? That seemed to have died then. But what about age range? Young people, elderly, that Because it's so early on in terms of the knowledge about it, as I say, it is a growing problem. The community psychiatric nurse who's involved in this case says she's now starting to come across more and more cases, but uh, we just don't know the age ranges at the moment because it's so early in the, in the early stages. I mean, you know, when you sniff it, like, you spray it, doesn't it? Oh. It just uh, it sort of got a, a nozzle on the top and they just literally put it in the mouth and uh, when you press the nozzle it just uh, expels into the mouth and you inhale it just as the woman was doing the video there. So it was like a Calajon BD4? Yeah, it's a liquid at first. Yeah. 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 Exactly like the BD4, yeah. So I wonder if there's a way that you could adapt it. I mean, Ben, I mean, how do we get this out to all areas then in all districts? Because clearly, you know, I'm thinking sort of parks, friends groups, you know, where young people perhaps congregate. How do we get this awareness out? Because I'm a member of another, a you know, few friends groups, probably all councillors are, and some parks and open spaces. <coughs> nothing like this has ever even crossed their minds, I don't think, you know, to be aware of and sort of, you know, use it out and how the relationship works is um, if something is identified at a district level then we come in and we work with the, the central team so the central prevention team so Gary Oakford and his team to make sure that all the district members of staff are made aware of it and then they can highlight it to partners so we're in the process of doing that 
that's why it's so sort of important that when we identify issues, we, we, we make sure that it's dealt with pan Merseyside and not contained within the district. So to give an example of that, um, the Liverpool City Council put on a presentation around the Care Act, which when they attended and the deputy attended, and then obviously that helps us look at our policies and procedures pan Merseyside. Same sort of issues around this is it's, it's Gary's team who are looking and coordinating how and what people contribute to the match. So everything that's found on a district is fed in centrally and then coordinated and goes out because we need to have a coordinated message so it will come out in due course. Um, and again, it, we need to understand exactly what the issue is before we sort of have widespread panic. Make one, one kind of broader in addition observation. What's all about is a health related issue as much as it is anything else. So saying now I'm one guilty of a, a, a particularly you know, at risk young lady. Um, the fact of the matter is Ben's quite right. We, we share that information more broadly across you know, the, the districts, you know, through the district management structure. Um, and you know that information will be related to that in that regard. But we picked it up, and the, 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 the reason why it's highlighted is because of the fire risk associated with it as well. And when that's taken into the centre, there's, certainly there's a significant amount of work now, part, part of the, the revised uh, home safety strategy, which will include training of carers. Um, and so carers who are going into people's homes start to recognise not only the health risks associated with some of the things that individuals do, but also the fire risks associated with it as well. So where does you know, that referrals come in, not necessarily specifically <coughs> the, you know, the, the, the actions that have been taken more around the kind of quantities, um, but as we start to kind of develop that and people are going in with a, 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 a wide eyes and, and a kind of recognise and appreciate that they're referring directly to us, so that sort of stuff will start to emerge. And as it starts to emerge, you know, then that will be shared more broadly. And then, you, you know, there is the, the, the opportunity to deal with that through kind of more, more broader campaigns. Uh, probably campaigns which are led by other partner agencies, not necessarily fire specific. Um, but the fact that we are acknowledging our role within health and tackling those kind of issues, I think it's something that you know that should be applauded, particularly in these the, the circumstances. And to be honest, you know, if we were if, you know, certainly Mike and Ben and you know when you start to have them conversations, this is not a one off, but it is an emerging issue. Some of these things emerge and then you go away as quickly as if if that's the come. However, the fact of the matter is, we are aware of this now, we are sharing that information with some of our kind of key partners, and it is on their radar in relation to how they address that. Um, and, you know, let's be clear, I don't think this is Liverpool specific, I think this is something which is um, probably kind of across the UK, you know, and, and Merseyside. So, you know, our crews, our operating crews are aware of the kind of the fire risks, um, but also our partners are aware of the, the emerging issues around uh, substance issues. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's just a for information page only. As um, I sit on the adult safeguarding boards for Liverpool as well as the health and wellbeing, and I can just make a point one being put forward actually gets it distributed so many different partners from many different organisations and members of it. And when the actually this was, was discussed, so it actually gets pulled out to everybody, and, and an awful lot of partners take away this information, and that's how it is. Really useful in that way, especially with the safeguarding board itself, which is, as you know, the new one now. And uh, the part, the number of partners out there is huge. And it's, 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 it's that information gets disseminated very, very quickly. Then it isn't just social work, there's more the people from the local authorities and every organisation, voluntary groups, and everything. And it's a great way forward. Sure. Thanks, thanks, sir. Uh, although we're not members of this. Uh, committee we thought we'd come and sit in. Uh, but it's very interesting to hear the presentation and thank the officers for the, the fantastic work we do. But for me this shows the importance of the, the fire and rescue service and, and the knowledge and the experience that I can bring to the table when we look at multi-agency working. Because as the, you know, the police officer quite rightly states about the impact that if we weren't there to identify this risk, would that have gone unknown? And if God forbid if anything would have happened to that young lady in that flat, it would have been a massive explosion. And we could have multi-fatalities. And you know, God knows what the impact that would have had 
among those individuals and those individuals' families <coughs> and the community. So it just goes to show, and that's why I think the fire service needs to you know, shout from the rooftops in a sense about the, this type of work that we, we can achieve and we can make a difference. Because the dynamics of our communities are changing, the risks are changing, the government's funding is coming. But we know the likes of this, if it went on, on files, you can imagine the catastrophe <coughs> that would make in any community. So, you know, again, thanks to everybody who's been involved with this. And it has, it has to continue. But I'd like to know, as, well, as we get more involved with this multi-agency approach, and we identify issues like this, who is the responsible organisation or authority to keep that data? And how does that debate data sort of roll out? Who's going to be the responsible owner of it? And when you highlight something that's shown, uh, as well, so the fact that there's nothing to stop any individual from buying butane gas from a corner shop or from the internet, who would then take the lead role to say there needs to be a change in legislation to ensure that things like this don't happen again, or at least deter people from doing it? Because when you think about it, any terrorist can go and buy that then. Oh, yeah. I can use that in any facility around this city or around this country. Yeah. So, you know, there's a bigger impact <coughs> on things like these that people realise. And it's not until something happens so we all sit up and take note of it and say, hang on a minute, why wasn't this highlighted? Why wasn't this noted? Why didn't people take it forward? Who was responsible for it? And all those questions get asked. So now that's been you know, highlighted to us and highlighted to the police, how do we take it forward? How do we address some of these concerns to make sure that a major incident doesn't, doesn't take, take effect here? Because, you know, we'll do our part and we'll do as much as we can in diminishing resources, but there's only so much that we can do. So it is concerning, and, and as Ben quite rightly said, with the Care Act, and obviously the people getting older, more independent living, and increasing dementia, Alzheimer's and things like that, increasing mental health. That's what we, that, that's the future in the sense of where, where are we? <coughs> and they're the people who will go under the radar because they don't <coughs> want to be associated with any particular social worker or you know, any particular organisation. They'll be the ones who might be sleeping in the street corner. You know, and they're the ones that we need to, you know, identify, address, work with organisations, try and get the results, so they don't cause a risk not only to themselves, but the wider community. So something like this should be presented to, you know, the relevant government minister to say, as good practice, this is what we've, we've addressed and this is what we've done to respond to it. And this, at the end, saves lives, saves, you know, issues with the, the National Health Service, and everything else following that, because if there was an inquest, you know, and you've got millions of millions of pounds, and yet there's something that, you know, from a simple visit from one of our advocates, highlights a, a problem, and then we, what would we all wait to get and we address it. So, fantastic outcome, but we need to make sure that we use that and we take it forward. Mm -hmm. Two things, you know, people you know, should, should be asked, I think, now for that identification if you want to buy a car. Second thing is, how quick would your data and these are, are uh, ladies and gentlemen, when they're going to a fire to know that this person is a butane gas user? Because my fear is that when you go to a fire uh, to a vulnerable person, vulnerable group person, that if, if you get the right address, that it comes up. Butane or solvents user for your safety going in there. That should come right. Are you with me? Yeah, absolutely. If I may, I'll respond to a couple of points really. One is uh, Councillor Hamati's reference to so, so what we do as we pick some that stuff up. And then made reference to the fire rescue service being a bed within the multi agency safe arm hub. Um, and whilst we have done some significant work in Liverpool, that's the same in, in, in each one of the, uh, the, the local authority districts, so you should be very sure from that perspective that very shortly we will have a fire officer in every one of those uh, strategic uh, hubs, so the safeguard hubs where that information will be exchanged around particularly vulnerable individuals and you know, the multi agency approach, depending on what the circumstances for that individual or you know, themes, particularly drug related in this instance or certain substances <coughs> in this instance will be picked up and dealt with as a, as a multi-agency group of individuals with I know, 
sometimes find that you say maybe need that lead on it, other times it will be the police, other times it may be the local authority, but that will be picked up through uh, the safeguard and hopes of which uh, Merseyside police have been leading on the implementation. They are they're all there and helps now across every one of the districts so that functionality is in place. In respect of the information being available to crew that I can't, you know, <coughs> Council Southern is absolutely correct. You know, it, it's very, very important that, if, that information is available to operating crews should we be aware of some of the risks that are contained within the home. Sometimes we're not, sometimes we are turning up to that property, you know, blind and, and, and they're not, they're not making a positive prior to us uh, going through the front door. On other occasions, due to the work that was done around prevention, through fire crews, through prevention staff, we will have better information about the, the risks that are within the home, and that may be from oxygen through to I don't know, uh, arson and, and, and so on and so forth. That information is readily available for operational crews by, by the risk, <coughs> of risk information system, so when they turn out, that information flags up, so crews are a little bit informed around what they can expect when they turn up, and that will form the, the dynamic plan that they put in place at that particular juncture. Um, so there's a couple of reassurances there really in relation to the information if we've got it and we've gathered it, particularly through some of our partner agencies, we will utilise it. And you know, the reassurance around the multi-agency plan <coughs> holds and their structure, which should allow a multi-agency response now to some of the issues that have been identified and um, because they exist across the communities. Thanks, Joe. Uh, a couple of comments, really. First, can I say what a brilliant presentation and great work going on in Liverpool. Absolutely well done. Um, the work that's going on in Liverpool, along with the anti-social behaviour, I think is absolutely excellent. <coughs> I hope it's going to be, go all across the five authorities. The other thing I wanted to share with you was that um, last year I did a piece of scrutiny work within St Anne's Council and it was over uh, small fires uh, and antisocial behaviour and what we found was that there was an awful lot of problems with children buying these barbecue trays from pound shops or garages and what we asked for well, could be an age limit put on that if you can't buy a packet of cigarettes why should you buy something that you set fire to and leave it there to, uh, to burn and cause a nuisance to uh, people. Uh, Shannon Wright You've got to put cigarettes behind a, a board now in shops. But what I was told from the licensing department is we can't do that. We, that is legislation. And it's up to us to, to lobby and get in there with our MPs and ask them to do something about these uh, gas cylinders that they're using and these barbecues people. If there is <coughs> an age limit on it, that could be more acceptable. Thanks, Joe. Well, thanks, as I said, thanks, Ben, to the other team for the such a good presentation. It's an interesting item on that we've got to I think it's scary so much as we're counselling from different parts of the side, and we have no knowledge of this until we come here today. You see things where you go to supermarkets where you can have a box of parts more and stop you buying more. There's obviously got to be a lot of lobbying done, and there's probably other substances out there that, you know, are flammable, people are abusing, and you know, some of be legal. I mean, I don't want to even go to schools and start to say, you know, this is horrific, really, what's going on. But at the end of the day, you're right, you know, Sharon's right, somebody's, you can kill them, kill all these people, but then things go wrong. It is such a scary thing, and I think a lot more needs to be done, a lot more awareness needs to be put out there. But thanks for your presentation, really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Um, you can no, you might only change that. Inside of you, Given that we're all here, I think we best go and got a Other things to do, four councillors. <laughs> 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 Is everybody alright? Is that
Examples, um, the generic and site specific ops response plan. The operational procedure review team is now established and they're working on aligning local operational guidance to national guidance. And another one is um, prevention and protection youth engagement. In March 2015, we received a matrix award for our youth engagement work, which is provide cadets to beacon and prepare courses. And that work will continue again in order for uh, functional action. The 39 service delivery plan functional plan action points this year. Some 15 have been concluded. They include replacing all BA sets. We've done that. Phase 2 of the HR integrated project has been delivered. That comes under the action point for 15 and 16 because we're going to deliver phase 3. Um, and the technological support for the establishment of the JCC, obviously complete. So which you've carried forward, um, a response action is the implementation and development of the STARS people management system. It's in place, but it's going to continue and develop. HOD are going to implement the capability procedure and revised absence management procedures. And prevention are going to implement the risk-based targeting for prevention <coughs> activities for ASB, <coughs> state conditions and seasonal plans. Of the 27 KPIs, KPIs we had in 14 and 15, 12 met their target, 5 are within 10% of the target, 8 failed to reach the target, and 2 are reported annually. I'll go into more detail in the next slide. where KPI performance has been on or above target. Total fires, there were 1,551 less incidents than this year than there were in 13 and 14. Primary fires, we attended 164 less primary fires than we did last year. Accident <coughs> fires, 103 less than the previous year. Deliberate unoccupied properties, there were 20 less in unoccupied and one less in, in occupied properties. We've attended life risk incidents within 10 minutes on 96.2% of occasions. And carbon output for this year is slightly higher, but below our target, which is 113, and we've actually achieved 89. Key performance indicators within 10% of their target. Deliberate non-domestic fires. There were six more incidents than last year, and in quarter four we saw nine incidents, six of them in prisons, five at Old Cross, which is a pattern we can see, continue to see at the moment. <coughs> Deliver vehicle fires. Um, we're 43 more than there were in last year. We were just 14 over our target for this year, but there were 43 more than last year. And we, we, we recognise that this is down to criminality on the majority of occasions. Automatic fire alarms, there were 4,440 incidents against a target of 4,290. That's 54 more incidents than last year. Areas where we haven't met our targets this year. Sadly, we've had another three 
fatality in accidental dwelling fires in the fourth quarter. All over 78, all male, all lived alone. And the latest was 89 year old male, and the cause was bedding for a heater. So that leaves us with 10 for the whole year 10. RTCs and related injuries. There were less in quarter four of the year than there have been in the previous quarters of the year. But there were 958 more incidents than last year. Operational staff injuries we talked about at our last meeting and I do draw to that in the third slide. Sickness is slightly improved in the fourth quarter. Um, there were 8.88 shifts lost to sickness absence compared to 9.11 in quarter three. And the biggest improvement has been in the non-uniformed indicator. We've, we've gone from 9.33 shifts lost to absence in quarter one to 7.81 in quarter four. So that's quite a significant improvement. At the last meeting, <coughs> it was asked that we split injuries to operational staff into what were that incidents and what were at risk critical training. As you can see, there were 22 injuries to incidents and six at risk critical training. I won't go into any more detail on this because there has been a report submitted by Group Manager McNeil, which is for item six on the agenda. Of the KPIs reported annually, staff appraisals, the deadline for submitting staff appraisals has been extended to the 31st of March, so at the moment we're not able to give you a figure, but that will be added when we have it after the 31st of March. With regard to the increase in the diversity of our workforce and volunteers, we're able to report on this for the first time because we've taken on some firefighter recruits and we've also taken on some apprentices. Successful applicants of those 92.6% were white. This actually compares favourably with Merseyside where the population is 94.6 white. So we've got 92.6, Merseyside is 94.6. And this will be our benchmark for the future. To measure against. And that's it, just a short report. Is there any questions? Right, uh, anybody comments? Just uh, a bit more information in, in regards to the accidental fires. Yeah. Do, do, do we keep, as you mentioned about the, the, the bedding from that, mm -hmm. uh, 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 do we keep the record of what each accidental fire was caused by? Yeah, we have that, we have that information. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you, you know, it would be very interesting to see that if, this, if, it's, if it is going to climb or if it's specifically in one area, because I just said we talk about the number of other areas we sit on yeah. and, and how the operations we can work together to prevent that cross from the social care. Yes, yeah. Jeff, yeah. 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 I may ask a kind of Jackie's comments there. Um, the answer is yeah, we, we do. Um, and we know a great deal of, of information about the kind of five fatalities, the causes, the circumstances, and so on and so forth. Uh, of the ten fire deaths, you know, eight of those individuals who were in the fire last year were over the age of 65 years of age. So it starts to kind of, you know, reinforce some of the things we already know as a authority. We've also done, which I will, I will again circulate to authority members for information. We've done a review of the last 10 years worth of, of, of fake information around of people who die in fires. Um, and there are no surprises in that, in that respect in regards to people who are over 65, people who live alone, people who have serious mobility difficulties, people who smoke, people who drink and so on and so forth, are some of the, you know, the, the factors which are associated with fire deaths for ourselves. But that information is drawn together and it's drawn together in a, in a report which I'll, I'll circulate to members for their information. It's also the intention that that information is brought to the attention of the community safety partnership but also the health and wellbeing boards across um, the whole of the, 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 the Merseyside um, and we're in the process now of identifying certainly those with responsibilities for adult social care and public health and inviting them to, to Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service <coughs> to talk about some of the kind of actions that we can take around data sharing but also in relation to kind of just some you know, things which are starting to kind of cause some concerns about people remaining in their own home, the risks associated with that, how to refer them to the Fire and Rescue Services just to reinforce some of the kind of key messages for ourselves um, and particularly around you know, the implications or certainly potential implications of the CARE Act um, and, you know, and uh, how we manage out some of the kind of 
issues and heart failure blocker and hospitals and so, and so on and so forth. So that is that is where in progress, but we have uh, with our incident investigation team, I would suggest probably one of the best incident investigation teams in the whole of the UK. So the information that we hold on specific fires, as I say, in the circumstances that we've you know, uh, uh, led to them will probably be the best informed fire and rescue fires in the country. And we utilise that to try and uh, endeavour to prevent them again in, in, in the first instance. But the other bits are just, and I've said this uh, previously, whilst we had 10 fire fatalities this last year, which is a significant increase in, on, on certainly the last two, three years, uh, we had a reduction in the number of accidental fire fires over the period as well. So, you know, that doesn't necessarily or you would expect it doesn't necessarily call it. That's it's that kind of extending that work with our uh, public health, uh, you know, local authority partners that we need to kind of fully understand what the, uh, the implications and the reasons behind that are. Or it might just be that uh, it's a spike and it's a one but you know, rather understand that and, uh, rather than not, in this case, maybe. Your favourite? Just one minute, Chairman. It isn't just the, the fatalities. You don't want to think of it. There is going to be greater emphasis, not only from government at the moment, but even from local authorities, about allowing people to stay at home longer. There's, there's, there's so much work and, and resource going into that. Now, if there, if there is something that shows us that uh, fires are happening because of a specific issue, I mean, this is, I think, the, an important part of fire authority has to play them with local authorities to work closely with them to say, if you're going to keep a lot of people at home, which, which is the idea, to level their life in, in the way that they want to, rather than institutions. At the end, at the end of the day, then we've got to make sure the safety is, is, is prevalent. So, if there is that kind of information, not just about the fatalities, but how each one is caused, then in, in reality, it's that's a kind of way both with public health and, and, and social services and, and others, the CCGs, for example, uh, <coughs> to start working together. So, I, I'd like to, if we can, I'd like to see that information over the last couple of years, uh, not just the fatalities, but how each fire is, is occurring, because. You know, it was mentioned before about the North West now, um, looking to, to different kind of groups who, who are starting to come here. Now, you, you know, it isn't just the bad landlords now, it's, it's, it's people who are tenants who don't understand the problems that are there. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. Let's look to get all that information. Because you might, yeah. as, as far as the, the safeguarding boards <coughs> and um, the health and well-being, that, that kind of information needs to be discussed fully with them for the future. Okay. Mine was around road traffic accidents. Um, I just wonder how realistic it is for us to have any targets, to be honest, because that's something that happens and we just have to attend. And I think, <coughs> the, I think the diff there's such a variance between what we predicted, sort of and what actually happened. And I'm just concerned about the impact on our operational uh, ability to attend that many. In respect of uh, our statutory requirements, uh, the way our statutory requirements respond to road traffic collisions, you know, to support the extrication of individuals who are in harm. And I suppose the, the, the kind of the other bit of that is what, what regards to be educated and informed and, and, and you know, young people or whoever it may be around the dangers of, of road traffic collisions. And clearly that is a preventative measure that we take on behalf of the authority. And it's probably alluded to by uh, Group Manager Ryder around working with police and local authority and ourselves to target those vulnerable groups to either having you know, a, an accident as a pedestrian or having an accident as being a driver of a vehicle or even potentially a passenger. And how you know how do we ensure that the information is, is is passed on in the best, most kind of accessible way to those individuals as well? So we're with the, you know, the, the local authority probably broadly pick up pedestrian safety, and you know the police pick up the important aspects of, 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 of trying to you know educate in a different way the dangers of driving through enforcement, and then we have up until this point picked up and um, you know young people in a broad sense around target people who are aged between 15 and 25 because they are you know, more at risk in relation to driving at speed and, and you know, under the influence of, you know, sometimes under the influence of just their friends and, and people who are in the car with them as encouraging them. Um, <coughs> and we've had an impact in relation to somebody from nowhere and the, and the, the delivery of that. 
um, educational package. We're, we're in the process now of it's better understanding the, the, the totality of the number of calls and threatens within the, the report itself. We talked about SAT 19 data. And that's every incident, that's every road traffic collision that's been attended, not necessarily by the you know, fire service, but equally both by, by the police. Once we gather all that information, that gives us a better indication of actually who is the most vulnerable groups and whether we are collectively targeting the right individuals. Because again, the fair number of people who have accidents on the road to Merseyside don't even live in Merseyside. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we targeted interventions there, you know, as long as every fire <coughs> service or any police service in the UK, you know, targeted in the same way, you know, it, it would have some traction. If you don't, then you know, we might not necessarily be getting the best for the investment. But it, it, you know, the, the stats 19 data becomes very, very important to us to understand who is at risk uh, on our roads. At that point, we will be able to raise with our local authority partners and the police and say, right, okay, how are we going to tackle these and who is best placed to tackle them through, through intervention and who is you know, best to, you know, safe to be commissioned to deliver that service. And it's a whole uh, piece of work that is, that is ongoing really now. Just on the back of that, though, I think really. I'm more interested to know what would happen, hypothetically, if, because we're reducing our service capacity, um, and these seem to be going on, what happens if there's a fire and a road traffic accident? How, how do we manage both parts? <coughs> because we're required to do both. Yeah, we are, we are absolutely statutorily required to do both. Um, and given the, you know, the reduction of numbers of fire departments, it's really assured mm -hmm. that, you know, on any given day, those kind of incidents occur, we will have a road traffic collision in some area of Merseyside, we will have a fire somewhere else. And uh, you know, you look at the performance in regards to um, response standards and you know, making the kind of the, the times, it's 90 or 96 percent of occasions we meet the response times that we are required to attain, which far outstrips any of our resources again in the UK. So we have, we are managing our resources effectively now to be able to respond to both. Okay, so the reassurance is that we are not so stretched that we are unable to cancel. It's just when you respond. look at those numbers going up, it just seems to be going up like that, don't they? Yeah. Is it? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I was just going to ask from what we were just talking about a moment ago, you know, the, care, the change in the Care Act and older people being discharged, particularly older people, I'm talking about <coughs> being discharged from hospital to their own home, and clearly we would applaud that. But perhaps it's an item really where we should talk about on our future plan for next year. But would it not be a good idea to invite somebody along from the health service, particularly with responsibility for hospital discharges, um, just how we can as a fire service integrate more closely? Because I've seen for myself vulnerable old people being discharged from hospital. They'll tell the nurse or the whoever's assessing them, the physio, that they can walk upstairs. They give you a test, can you walk up four, which is nonsense, because you know who has only four in a house, it's usually 12. <coughs> Providing you can do that, you tick, they tick the box and you can go home. Old people who, again, confused going home, <coughs> the oxygen will be there when they get there. It's fine if they've got um, you know, family or, or people going in. And even, to be fair, if they've got carers coming in perhaps half a dozen times a day, it's when those people go. I think it's just a nightmare, really, waiting to happen. And I know that local authorities are working far more closely and going to in the future um, with the health service. And again, you know, it's something I would welcome. But I think, you know, till all that gets, gets going, really, and gets put in place, there's a huge vacuum there at the moment from people being discharged from hospital. And looking at it from a fire service point of view, I would suggest perhaps it may be a good idea to have, as I say,